Uh, it's hard to believe, but Christmas Eve is next week. It's a week from today. Can y'all believe that? 2017 has been a year, man. Where in the world has it gone? There's a couple things that I want to make clear to you about Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve service, uh, next week, we're going to have two services, one at 9, one at 11. Hear me, hear me closely now. The 9 o'clock will, it will have child care for three and under, okay? Child care, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, hey, you on your own, all right? You're going to be in here fighting and battling them kids. Hey, listen, I'm just telling you, I just want to let you know what to expect. So next week, two services, 9 and 11, child care at the 9, not at the 11. Also, uh, we're beginning to get some word about maybe some snow and some ice, right? So uh, we might get a white Christmas. Thanks, Bing Crosby. And in, uh, in order for you to stay abreast as to what we decide in case of inclement weather, we have the Fellowship Memphis app. Who in here has the Fellowship Memphis app? Amen. Praise God. If you don't have the Fellowship Memphis app, I, uh, you should go and download it. Not only is it, is it pertinent for information like inclement weather changes, but it's also got a, a, a ton of other stuff that'll bless your soul. Uh, Seth Jones and, and, uh, and our team there and Daniel McGarry, they've worked really hard in crafting that app for us. Uh, so I encourage you to download it. You can also create uh, uh, outpost specific notifications. So for East Memphis, you go in and click East Memphis, you get all the East Memphis information. This is the last thing. On Christmas Eve, we are looking for a few good men and women. We still have just a couple spaces that we need to fill as far as classroom teachers next week go, only about four or five. If you're interested in that, you can go into the app. And if you say, listen, I'm, I don't want to serve with the kids, right? but I will serve on Christmas Eve. This is just a one-time thing. You can go into the app and notify Laura that that's what you want, and all that stuff is pretty simple once you get in there. But I want to commend that to you guys. All good? Okay, John chapter 8. Typically in this church, <coughs> and not typically, but what has been characteristic of our preaching is that we are expository preachers, meaning that we take the text seriously by going line for line or thought for thought through God's word in order to expound the main idea of what God wants to say to his people, the timeless message. And that has been the recurring theme of this church for 13 plus years. But this morning, verse 12 of chapter 8 has been so good to me. It has been a bevy of spiritual nourishment, but it's also bottomless in its understanding of who Christ is that I just want to camp out in verse 12 this morning. I want to take the next 20 to 30 minutes and I want to look at verse 12, just verse 12, to see what it means for Jesus to be the light of the world. John chapter 8, when you get there, say, oh yeah. John chapter 8, verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I'm going to read that again. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks in me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the word of the Lord. And before considering it, we should pray. So let's pray. Help us, Lord, this morning to see what you would have for us. But Father, help for this morning to not simply be an intellectual exercise, but for your word to not only come to our zip code, not only come to our neighborhood, not only come to our house, but come into us, transforming and changing us. Would your word this morning create a longing in our heart for your second advent? And would we prepare ourselves for that day to come? Holy Spirit, you are the words that pin the hand, you are the hand that pinned the words on these pages. Would you be our God and our interpreter this morning? We love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. C.S. Lewis once famously opined that I believe in Christianity 
like I believe in the risen Son. Not only because I see it, but by it I see everything else. He said that I believe in Christianity not because, like I believe in the sun that has risen, not because I can see the sun itself, but because by it I see everything else. In essence, C.S. Lewis has said that <coughs> Christianity is, Jesus being the main actor, the light to the world. Growing up in my house, there was a very special but terrifying event that happened every evening. Every evening, we'd come home from school, and the first thing we'd do is we'd go play. Run outside, uh, playing basketball, football, baseball, hide and seek, uh, all sorts of things. But there was this one terrifying moment when you would begin to hear the hum of the streetlight. That when the street lights would hum, you knew that if you didn't get in the house ASAP, your mama was going to have her way with you. You see, there was a rule in my house that you had to be in the house by the time the street lights came on. Why? Because all sorts of things happen in the dark. All sorts of things happen when the sun goes down. I had a fifth grade teacher who said, Jason, I want you to know nothing good happens after midnight. That in the darkness of the shadows of midnight, there is death, there is destruction, darkness. Darkness is an interesting thing. You see, light can exist without darkness, but darkness doesn't really exist. If we're talking about light in its particle and wave form, light can exist without darkness, but darkness doesn't really exist because darkness is the absence of light. In Psalm 23, when, when David writes, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The picture he paints there in the desert during the rainy season, as soon as the rains begin to come down, it's so dry that the water carves channels. It carves these wadis, these mini canyons through the desert. And around the nooks and crannies of this canvas where the sunlight would not shine in the shadows, there would often lie thieves and robbers and no good doers. And what David's saying is, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even in the shadow, even in the darkness where I know death lies, I fear no evil because the one who holds my hand is even greater than the darkness itself. I want to preach a sermon this morning entitled, Jesus the Menace. Now, when we think about menace, some of you think about that famous 60s sitcom, Dennis the Menace. Others of you think about the early 90s film, Don't Be a Menace, and yet some of you think about Don't Be a Menace to Society while drinking juice and you know what I'm talking about. But what does it mean to be a menace? To be a menace is to be a person or a thing that is likely to cause harm, be a threat, or danger. When we get to John chapter 8, Jesus is presently a menace to the Pharisees and the religious establishment. He has made clear, he is not playing by their rules, he has made clear that the way that they practice religion, aka without him, is not only wrong, but it will damn them. Jesus is public enemy number one to the Pharisees. Jesus is public enemy number one to death and darkness. But in John chapter 8, verse 12, here in a moment, we'll see that Jesus is a menace to our own ignorance and apathy. I have four points this morning. The first one is this. When we get to John 8, verse 12, we must see point one. Jesus is God. Now, I say that, and some of you are like, Duh. 
And, what, and we've been saying the same thing for seven weeks, that Jesus is God. That the I am statement that Jesus makes links himself in Exodus chapter 3 when God reveals himself to Moses. And Moses says, when I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, who is it that has sent me? God says, tell them that I am has sent you. We've said this every week. But here's why this is important. This narrative is happening right in the middle of the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles which was the feast where all the Jews would go out and build tents and go sleep outside for a week. Now, I was never really into camping. I went camping for about three hours one night. I started hearing stuff, and I ran back inside, all right? I don't do camping. Don't ask me to go camping with you because it's not happening, all right? But they would sleep outside in booths, in tabernacles, to remember their wilderness journey, specifically to remember the God who delivered them through the wilderness from Egypt to Canaan. And every night, they would light a candle or a candelabra or a menorah as a symbol of the light that guided them out of slavery into emancipation. It was a reminder that if it had not been for God, they would have been lost. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's my testimony. If it had not been for the love of God, I would be Lost. I want to preach that, but I can't this morning. <laughs> so when you think about Jesus saying, I am the light of the world to the Pharisees, who equated the light of the world primarily with two occasions. One, creation, and two, the pillar of fire that led Israel and guided them through the wilderness. You see, the Pharisees and Jews understood that God was light. And not only was God light, but light was God in action. So in creation, when God speaks and all of the universe erupts from his vocal cords, there was in all of creation light. Stars, nebulas, planets, moons, light. And as God emancipated Israel out of Egypt into Canaan, there was the pillar of fire at which they understood to be that God is the light. In other words, the pillar of fire is a precursor to the understanding of Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. So if this pillar of cloud or pillar of fire is God with us, now Jesus is saying that I am the light of the world. They're thinking creation. They're thinking pillar of fire. They're thinking this man is saying that he's God. And Jesus is like, yep, I am. Now you can understand perhaps the scandalous nature of this to men who've been practicing a religion that doesn't include Jesus. Scandalous. And in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea, this understanding of Jesus being God is wrapped up in one word, homoousios. Homoousios is the word that means of the same substance or of the same essence. In other words, Jesus and God the Father are made of the same stuff. They are identical in power, identical in wisdom, identical in knowledge. And if Jesus is really God, then these religious folk, the ones practicing ritualistic religion, the ones getting together and having a spiritual pep rally together, the ones obeying rules in order to gain righteousness, what we would call legalism, if Jesus really is God, then these folk, these religious folk are doomed to hell. And they are because they practice a religion in darkness. The very nature of legalism, hear me, the very nature of legalism is practicing a religion without Jesus. Your legalism says that what I do, keeping rules, following order, doing things to the T, the very nature of that never invites Jesus in. In other words, If you are a religious person in this room practicing religion without Jesus, then you are in 
darkness. And these words of Christ speak to you. But there's good news. Because had it not been for a pregnant teenage mother having a baby out of wedlock, we would all be not only walking in darkness, but locked into darkness. You see, Jesus was born into darkness in order to bring light to the world. Second point. Legalism fools us and tricks us into believing that what we're believing and what we're practicing is true religion. And then Jesus shows up and he puts a mirror in front of your face and you look like the crypt keeper, right? But Jesus was born in darkness in order to bring light to the world to rescue us from our darkness. John 8, verse 12, again, he said to them, I am the light of the world. We've seen that Jesus is God wrapped up in this I am statement. What does it mean that Jesus is the light of the world? Advent is the season of expectant waiting and preparation. I want to take you back to that night in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. Here's Mary. Here's Joseph. They ride into Bethlehem because that's Joseph's crib. His kinfolk are there and they're there because Joseph has arrived for the census. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about Christmas that Mary's pregnant, she's on a donkey, they're at the inn, he's going around from house to house to house, yeah, all that's fabricated. Joseph and Mary was already there. By the way, Mary did know, y'all. I'm just telling y'all. She knew, all right? You sing that song, Mary, did you know? Mary knew, all right? <laughs> The Bible says she pondered these things in her heart. She already knew what time it is. She had counted the cost. That's, that's going to be Advent next year. Debunking Christmas myths. But Mary and Joseph, they're already in town. We hear, we've been told that they could find no room in the inn. But the more proper Greek rendering of that word is they could, there was no room in the guest room. Likely, Mary and Joseph went back to the crib to stay with family, and when they got to family, there was too many people staying in the guest room. So customarily, underneath a house would be a crawl space where you would keep livestock. And it was in this crawl space, which would have been fairly warm, because there would be hay there, there's fire down there, there's the warmth of the animals, but here underneath is where this pregnant teenage Mother, unwed, would give birth to the Christ child. Now, if I were God writing this story, and I'm God, I'm, I'm God, I'm coming to earth, earth, E-A-R-F, I'm coming to earth. If I'm God and I'm coming to earth, do you think I'm going to be born not just in a house, but underneath a house, sharing space, breathing the same air with livestock? by a pregnant teenage mother who's unwed in the cloak of darkness and in night, seemingly unannounced that nobody knows about it. And yet this is exactly how Christ Jesus came. If I'm God and I'm writing the story, there's going to be fireworks. It's going to be the aurora borealis on display. I'm having millions of people march, people screaming my name. Everybody is going to know that I'm on the scene. But God comes in seemingly anonymity. And Jesus comes under the cloak in the form of darkness in order to bring light to the world. You see, it's only here that Christ can really be for you. No other world religion offers a savior that is truly for you. They can say they're for you. They can say they're there for you. They can say they understand you. But how many of them who, though being fully God, encompassing and possessing all the power of the Godhead, wraps himself in human flesh and comes not as a conquering king, but a baby who knows what it means to be cold? who knows the stomach pangs of hunger, who knows the yearning for its mother's milk, who knows what it means to hurt and ache, who plays with his friends and he falls and he scrapes his knee and he knows pain, the one who feels and knows what it means to be betrayed. Only this Christ can truly bring light to the darkness because he's walked through darkness and he's conquered it himself. 
Jesus was born into darkness, both literally at night, but also into the moral decay of this world. My friends, you don't have to look around very far to find darkness in this world. You can turn on the TV. You can walk outside, but let me make it real easy for you. Pull up your phone and turn that camera around and look at yourself and tell me if you don't see darkness. So when we sing songs like, oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error, pining, stewing, marinating till he appeared and the soul felt its worth, a thrill of joy, a weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Here's what it means for Christ to be the light of the world. It's that in your darkness, in my darkness, in the darkness of this world, Christ enters it, he conquers it, and then he hands you the victory for it. Jesus was born in darkness to bring light to the world. That night, I imagine, in that cold spring night that the elements tried to kill him, maybe a goat or a donkey may have tried to back up and squash his head. As Jesus would grow up, Herod puts out a hit on his head. He sends out his henchmen. Herod can't kill him. Later on, Jesus' friends betray him. All of the religious folk who were supposed to be worshiping him turn their back on him. All of these folks try to kill him, but Time after time after time, they fail and they fail and they fail. And then Pilate, Pilate tried to kill him and he couldn't do it. This child, all of the plans of the enemy thwarted by a child. That's the power of Christ. That's the power of God in Christ. Let me put it this way, then we're going to move on. Jesus is the boogeyman to darkness. (laughs) Darkness looks under his bed for Jesus. When we consider what it means for him to be the light of the world, he is the light that shines into the deepest recesses of darkness. And that power, the power of the light in creation, the power of the light in the pillar of fire erupts onto the scene in the the form of a baby, erupts, not erupts, erupt, E-R-R-U-P-T, is a breaking uh, from inside out. Erupt, I-R-R-U-P-T, is a breaking in that that God, who exists out of time, breaks into time to bring light into the world. Why? So that we might follow him and find light. Third point, and this is important. Jesus receives followers. He repels fans. Jesus receives followers. He repels fans. The imperative follows the indicative here. The indicative, the truth statement is, I am the light of the world. The imperative, the action, the active part of this is, whomever follows me. Oh, but dear friends, I fear there are far more fans of Jesus than there are followers. You see, fans, they like Jesus as a good teacher. They like him as a good example. They like him as a good moral man. Fans can be in awe and amazement at the works of Jesus, frequently finding themselves impressed with God. These people gaze at sunsets, and they think God is awesome. These people see the birth of a child and they're taken aback and their breath is taken away. They might even see God working in their life. And for a season, they're enamored with God's goodness. But the difference between a fan and a follower is a follower of Jesus hears and obeys his words. Fans can exhibit the same characteristics of followers, but there's a key difference. Followers obey Jesus' words. 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 7 sums up what a fan looks like pretty well. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, 
And yet we walk in darkness, we lie, and do not practice the truth. That's a fan. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. What does a follower look like? What is someone who sees the light of the world and follows him look like? This is a person who believes on Jesus. They believe and obey his word, right? <clears throat> you see, fans treat God's word like a yield sign. God's word tends to be like a yield sign to fans. It's, it's the thing that slows you down just a little bit before you continue off into your wayward path of frivolity. Rather than a stop sign that stops you from doing those, not just because God is some buzzkill and don't want you to have fun, but because your best life is not found in those things, it's found in him. You see, a fan looks at God's word and tends to view it as a burden, as a set of impossible rules and standards to consider and to keep. But a follower of Jesus sees God's words as a loving mandate, as a covenant as guardrails, wide guardrails that say, hey, all the way in here, you good, baby, but don't get outside of that because I love you too much. Every time my family walks through a parking lot, my children have to hold one of their parents' hands because I love, it's not that I don't trust you driving your car, which I don't, but I want them to know that they're the safest when they're next to me. And I want them to know that they can, be away from me a little bit, but the closer they are to me, the safer they're going to be. And if you hold my hand, I will make sure nothing happens to you. God's word is God delivering not only what he thinks about you in love and affection, but also showing us the best way to please him and to get the most out of our time here. So a follower of Jesus believes on Jesus, believes and obeys his word. They exist to serve their brother, their sister, their neighborhood, their community, their city, the world. They connect with other believers in fellowship and in worship. But true followers also keep short accounts with Jesus. It's not a, it's not a hey, God, I haven't, you know, come to confession in six months kind of deal. It's short accounts. Lord, I know what I just did there was wrong. Please forgive me of my sin. And maybe if you're here and you haven't kept short accounts with God, I just want you to think about this. It's a quote from a New Testament scholar named Bruce Ware. He says, if all you fear are the consequences of, or all you lack is the opportunity to, then that sin has you. If all you fear are the consequences of that sin, then that sin has you. Or if all you lack is the opportunity to engage in that sin, then that sin has you. True followers keep short accounts with God, and if you're here and you're breathing, my friends, it's not too late. You can keep short accounts with God. If we were to continue reading in 1 John 1, if we were to continue to read to verse 9, we would find that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we follow Jesus, he offers us life, both life now and the life to come. And that life is marked by peace and comfort and joy and love. True life, our best life, is found with Jesus. True life with Jesus means that God is victorious over the darkness. Heard a story a couple weeks ago about a soldier who had dug himself into a hole, a literal hole. A senior non-commissioned officer walks by, sees him in the hole. The man says, hey, can you help me out? The senior non-commissioned officer says, suck it up, dig deep, try harder, and he threw him a shovel. And there he is with this shovel trying to get himself out of this hole. And next, a senior commissioned officer walks by. He says, sir, can you help me? The senior officer says, son, Use the tools that we gave you. Use the tools that we gave you to get out of this hole. And he threw him a bucket. So here's this soldier in a hole, digging a hole, using this shovel, using this bucket, trying to get out. 
And all the while, he's just digging himself deeper and deeper and deeper. And he's covered in sweat. And he's covered in foam. He's covered in dirt. Next, a psychiatrist walks by him and he screams out. He says, help me, help me, get, help me get out of here. And the psychiatrist says, hey, here are some pills. Take these pills. And these pills, they're going to make you forget about the hole. And he took the pills and he was fine until the pills ran out. And when the pills ran out, he realized that he was back in a hole and he's screaming and he's deeper than he's ever been and he can't get out. And all of a sudden, another soldier walks by. <laughs> and he looks down in the hole and this man's deep by this point. And the guy screams at him. He's like, hey, man, can you help me? The soldier hops into the hole. The, so, the guy in the hole is like, what are you doing, man? Now we're both in a hole. Now we both can't get out. The man who jumped into the hole looked at him. He said, calm down. I've been here before. I know how to get out. Before we go to this last fourth and final point, I want you to know that this is what Christ is for you. If you're in sin, if you're locked in a sin pattern, or behavior, I want you to know that Christ has hopped in the hole with you. And he's raised and been risen victorious, and he knows the path forward. Trust him in that. Fourth and final point, that I'm going to be out your hair. Hop off the detour and come home. Hop off the detour and come home. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. But whoever doesn't follow me will walk in darkness. Some of you have been walking in darkness too long, my friend. Come home. It's never too late to come home. You can always come home. Come home. Because next to Jesus, when we walk in the life, we find true life in the light. When you follow Jesus, my friends, you get Jesus. The one who is your good shepherd who cares for your soul the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, who is the best path, he's the best way, and he's the only way to God, come home. Jesus is the true vine and branch that abide in him that you may bear much fruit, for apart from him, you can do nothing. Get off the detour and come home to Jesus, who is your open gate. He's the open door. He's the way to God, the one who cares for your soul. Come home. He is the true bread of heaven, the true bread of life, the true sustenance. Eat of him. You'll never hunger or thirst again. Come home. Jesus is your light that only by him is true life found. Come home. It's never too late to come home. And when I think about what it means for Jesus to be the light of the world, I can't th help to think about this stanza from O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer. Our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to fight. Jesus will be and is the menace to your darkness if you come home. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you see how dark my heart is the decisions I frequently make that do not please you and that in fact they grieve you. That I frequently find it's impossible to, seemingly impossible to do the right thing and yet you tell me to follow you. For if we follow you and keep our eyes on you, you will keep us from hurt, harm, and danger and you will provide for us a true hope. Jesus, I pray that your light, the light that shines into the world, the light that shines into the darkness, would even now begin to shine in those recesses, those hidden off places, those sectioned off places of our lives that we've kept hidden, the ones that we are embarrassed and ashamed of anyone seeing, God, that you would show us that you provide true forgiveness, that you will wipe those things away as if they had never existed. Father, I thank you for that promise. And Lord, as we come to the table this morning, would we remember that though the enemy thought he snuffed out your light on Calvary, you shined out of that grave three days later, showing and displaying your victory in a way as if to say, death, if we were in a phone booth, you couldn't touch me. Lord, we love you. Come be with us now, even in this moment, Jesus, we pray. Amen.